Thank you very much indeed. That concludes the statement. We move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 6523 in the name of Craig Hoy on national care service uh, viability. I would ask members wishing to participate to press their, uh, their request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. Uh, I would encourage members who are leaving to do so as quickly and as quietly as possible. And I call on Craig Hoy to speak to and move the motion. Mr Hoy, uh, for up to seven minutes, please. Can we have Mr Thank Hoy? Thank you, Deputy Hoy. Presiding up Officer. To this SNP Government is setting out on the most radical reform of Scottish public services in the history of devolution. But ministers cannot deny that they have been warned about the very real risks of the National Care Service. Warned by their own MSPs, Michelle Thompson and Kenny Gibson. Warned by charities about the risks to the continuity of care. Warned by Audit Scotland about the financial risks and IGBs about the risks to care across the country. Warned by councils of the risks to local democratic accountability by care home providers about the impact on the independent and third sectors, and rural councils who warn of the risks of creating a central belt-focused service, warned by health and social care partnerships about the risks of proceeding with a framework bill when we know so little detail about the scope of the service, by alcohol and drug charities about the impact on services for those with dependency issues, and by unions about the risks to workforce planning and development warned by labour groups about the risks to pay and conditions, by social workers about the impact of detaching social work from local services such as housing and employability, and, and by council chief executives about the very real risks of shifting 75,000 council workers to a bloated bureaucracy, warned even by this parliament's corporate body over the risk of a grab on Holyrood's powers of appointment, and by the legal profession about the risks of losing cohesive responsibility in the care provided in complex cases, and even warned about the legality of pushing through sweeping changes through a framework bill and delegated legislation. Presiding officer, despite these repeated warnings, this SNP government continues to sail towards the iceberg. Humza Yusuf is still apparently supremely confident that he can captain the National Care Service despite sinking Scotland's National Health Service. Under the SNP, our NHS and social care systems are in crisis, which is why it is all the more reckless for this Government to embark on wholesale structural reform when urgent action is needed at the front line. The Minister is ignoring warnings about the crisis he faces today. He simply dismisses criticisms of this reckless and unaffordable legislation. He ignores the present funding crisis in local government and social care. He dismisses concerns from a workforce which is underpaid, worn down and burnt out. He overlooks the acute lack of staff and provision in care at home. He sets aside the skills and workforce crisis in residential social care. He is ignoring the crisis in drug and alcohol services. And instead of taking concrete steps to properly fund social care at the local level, the SNP want to embark on a massive restructuring diverting millions needed to invest in staffing at the front line and into the pockets instead of civil servants and administrators. Why can't the Minister see that social care organisations and unions are terrified about this misguided plan? COSLA, Unison, Community Integrated Care, NHS Lothian, Scottish Care, Parkinson's UK, Highland Council, East Lothian IGB, City of Edinburgh Council, Angus Health and Social Care Partnership, the MS Society, the Faculty of Advocates, the list goes on. The SNP's own members have raised their heads above the parapet to express concerns over how this government will fund its national care service. And after destroying council's finances, they are looking to do the same in social care. Audit Scotland is warning that the already eye-watering predicted costs of £1.3 billion are likely to be an underestimate. And even after this framework has been published, Big questions remain. How is a top-down system, consistent with the Christie Commission's view that services must be designed with and for people? How will this system eradicate the postcode lottery in care? How will commissioning and collective bargaining work coherently and consistently on a national basis? How will care boards be comprised? Where will be the democratic accountability? What impact will this massive shift 
have on local authority budgets and won't any efficiencies gained in the economy of scale achieved through the NCS be wiped out by the equivalent loss in economies of scale within local government? And where are the calculations on the cost savings that an, NH that an NCS will achieve? Because, Minister, the financial memorandum is very vague indeed. And what impact will the NCS have on capital investment into social care today because councils are pulling back? And isn't this power grab likely to be an asset grab as well? Presiding officer, the Nationalists have learnt nothing from the shambolic centralisation of Police Scotland, a move which left the service plagued by financial problems, plagued by a lack of accountability, plagued by cuts at the front line. The NHS is in crisis. The SNP have put our police service on the brink, and they are now determined to go the same way with social care. I give way. Emma Roddick. The NHS, and I note that his party voted against the creation of the NHS 22 times. Does he not recognise that it's people with lived experience who fed into these proposals and are asking us to create this new public service? Craig Hoy. The Conservative Party may not have given birth to the NHS, but it is Conservative government after Conservative government that has nurtured through good times and bad. And that is why today, and that is why today, in our motion, the Scottish Conservatives are calling on the SNP to scrap these wasteful plans and put every penny back into frontline social care. Presiding officer, we want to see a national care service, a local care service, sorry, that empowers communities, a change in culture and a change in delivery at the local level. A service which is underpinned by a simple commitment to ensure that people access care in their local area, close to their family and close to their support networks. Because centralisation doesn't just pose risks to those who work in the care system. It poses risks to those who need care and to the families who need to be around them. The National Care Service poses a very real risk of an increase in cruel out-of-area care which splits families from loved ones. And the SNP falls back on one justification and one justification alone, that the reforms will create consistency despite having no real plan to achieve it. Yeah. Deputy Presiding Officer, the only thing consistent about a national care service is the opposition to it. Yep. Opposition from councils, yep. opposition from NHS boards, yep. from unions and the workforce, from charities, opposition from royal colleges, from the independent and third sector, and now opposition from normally supine SNP backbenchers. But Minister, there is a way out. The iceberg can be avoided. The SNP can urgently U-turn on a national care service. They can back our common sense, local care driven approach. And unless they do, once again, overstretched care workers, vulnerable patients, and their families will suffer. I urge colleagues across the Scottish Parliament to support quality local care and back our motion tonight. And I move the motion, uh, the Scottish Conservative motion, in my name. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Just a reminder to colleagues that we are extremely tight for time and members will have to accommodate any interventions in their time allocation. With that, I call Kevin Stewart to speak to a move uh, amendment uh, 6523.3, Minister, for up to six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. And first of all, I'll move the amendment in my name. Uh, President Officer, the Bill sets out our clear principles for the future of a National Care Service. And it is against these principles that the Bill should be scrutinised that the detail will be designed and that we will monitor the benefit. We are not just suggesting change to address the challenges of today. We must build a public service fit for tomorrow. Today, at least 232,000 or 1 in 25 people receive care support in Scotland. Demand is only going to grow and we need to recognise the risk of increased pressure on an already fragile system and act now. Our ambition for the National Care Service is to establish a social care system that empowers people to thrive, not just enable them to survive. Health and care support are an investment and they must work to remove barriers and tackle inequalities. And the principles of any new system should be person-centred with human rights at the very heart. This means that the NCS must be delivered in a way that respects, protects and fulfils the human rights of people accessing health and care support. Uh, another fundamental principle is inclusion. This morning I visited Tifereth, a Camp Hill community based in Edinburgh, 
to learn more about their work supporting the life and work of adults with learning disabilities and autism. We must get it right for everyone. We have an opportunity to include many people across society in a conversation about their needs, a conversation that they have traditionally been excluded from. I would like to thank carers, both paid and unpaid, for their remarkable work providing critical and invaluable support to people across our country. The cost of living crisis has an impact on everyone in Scotland, and that includes the social care workforce and unpaid carers. By working in collaboration with our partners, we want to see improvements in recruitment and retention, fair work and ethno ethical commissioning. I don't really have time, President Officer. Uh, I'll maybe take Ms Smith. briefly. Very quickly, and thank you. Can, can I just ask the uh, Minister, th these are laudable aims that you've just spelled out. Why are so many stakeholders opposed to this bill? Minister. There are stakeholders who are not content with all aspects of this. But what I would point out, what I would point out to the Chamber, what I would point out to the Chamber is that this is about people. And people in the consultation backed the National Care Service overwhelmingly. This is about people. That is who we need to listen to. Uh, and we are, as a government, fully committed to improving the experience of the social care workforce, increasing levels of pay as we recognise and value the work that they do. The government is taking action now. From April this year, we provided funding of £200 million to local government to support investment in health and social care, embed improved pay and conditions, and deliver a £10.50 minimum wage for all adult social care staff and commission services from 1 April uh, of this year. The government has been leading the way in the UK in improving pay, terms and conditions. Uh, I am shortly due to chair an event with COSLA unions, providers, to discuss how we work together to make further improvements now. Government alone cannot do it. Working with all our partners, we can make significant improvements. Financial sustainability is a principle set out in the Bill. We need to ensure that we can deliver continuity and security of service for the people who access those services. The Government has already committed itself to increase spend in social care by 25% uh, by the end of the Parliament to help lay the groundwork for the establishment of a National Care Service. Through plans for uh, an ethical commissioning framework, we will ensure increased financial transparency, allowing us to prioritise quality of care and better understand cost and profit across mixed economy of providers. I've got a lot to go through, so I'm not going to take Ms Bailey, President Officer. Uh, we must reintroduce a focus on early intervention and prevention. We must limit the number of people who end up in crisis. People want and need quality services delivered at a time and by a method that best suits their needs and that builds on their strengths. Last week, I met with representatives from the Fife Social Work team and heard about their initiatives, Social Care Off the Books, delivering in the Pathhead and Dysart areas of Kirkcaldy. It's a community approach aimed at reducing crisis care, and it's critical that we learn from existing good practice uh, a lot, uh, from across the country. The NCS Bill sets out a framework for change. The detail relies on us all, including those of us here today and beyond, to work together. We need to grasp the opportunity to deliver public service improvement together to ensure we're getting the detail right for everyone. And such an approach requires trust and confidence in each other and in the process. And we need to recognise the implementation gaps that the independent review highlighted between legislation and delivery. I've been honoured to chair the Social Covenant Steering Group over the last 12 months. They will be critical in holding us to account on the priority of the voices of lived experience as part of the design phase. People confirmed to us that they are supportive of the proposals as part of last year's consultation. The sooner that we start, the sooner we will be able to deliver better care support for everyone. 
Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Minister. I now call Paula Kane for up, uh, to speak to move Amendment 6523.2 for up to five minutes. Mr O'Kane. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Over a decade ago, the Scottish Labour Party called for the creation of a national care service. Our vision was rooted in the belief that social care could be transformed to deliver exceptional national standards of care across Scotland. It was about changing the culture, not the structures, by ensuring that our social care system treated people with dignity and ensuring our care staff were respected as skilled professionals. Sadly, what the Scottish Government has proposed lacks substance, lacks vision and increasingly lacks the confidence of key stakeholders, including trade unions, COSLA, care providers and staff working on the front line. Indeed, yesterday at the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee, COSLA Health and Social Care Spokesperson Councillor Paul Kelly clearly outlined on behalf of councils across Scotland, of all political stripes, including uh, the SNP, the huge concerns about what this bill will do to local government, taking power away from local communities, placing it in the hands of ministers and then using secondary legislation to design the National Care Service. Indeed, he raised concerns that many councils may become unviable. Presiding officer, I and the Scottish Labour Party have serious concerns about the Scottish Government's vision of the National Care Service. But if the Minister won't listen to me, perhaps he will listen to his own colleagues who are also losing confidence in their own government's ability to deliver what they promised. We heard last week in the Finance Committee uh, from Kerry Gibson, who compared the government's approach as being akin to taking a sledgehammer to crack a nut, and as he described, uh, and I quote, the monumental risk in relation to the financial memorandum and the lack of detail therein. Yes, presiding officer, that I have a lot to get through, um, so I do want to make some progress. The loss of confidence in this proposal has been growing week on week, and that is why Scottish Labour today are calling for the bill to be paused. Let me be clear, it is not about trying to get one over on the Minister or opposing for the sake of opposing. What we are debating today, presiding officer, is far too important for that. This is about a fundamental principle, the principle of good lawmaking and creating a national care service worthy of the name. It is irresponsible to press ahead with legislation which is not fit for purpose and does not command the confidence of key stakeholders. We cannot afford to get these reforms wrong. Indeed, we have had 15 years of this government ignoring social care. Half-baked solutions will only deepen the problems in the sector. Uh, President Officer, if Emma Harper wants, uh, I'm happy to give way. Emma Harper. Fantastic. Thank you for uh, taking an intervention. I just want to ask um, Paul O'Kane, as a member of the Health and Sport Committee, which I am as well, do you not just uh, concede that we're two sessions into the scrutiny in this bill, that there's time to submit changes, there's time for taking evidence, but everybody's jumping on this right now uh, as if it's, it's a, a, a massive issue. We, don't we need to take the time to scrutinise it and, and allow all the voices to come out. Paula Kane. You know, what I recognise, presiding officer, is that the government have been talking about this and consulting on this for months. And what I recognise is that COSLA in evidence said that they found out about the government's framework legislation proposals the night before they were published. I don't think that's acceptable. And I think there are growing calls from across all sectors that we need to take this pause and reflect. And I'm going to say again to the Minister, if he won't learn from me and he doesn't want to listen to me, then perhaps he should learn from John Swinney. In 2018, the Deputy First Minister listened, reflected and took the sensible decision to pause the Education Bill when he recognised that stakeholders had serious concerns about the move to legislation. The process that then flowed from that was co-designed with councils, teachers, parents and staff and it is um, the regional Improve improvement collaboratives we would recognise today. I am running short of time. I'm about to go into my final minute, but uh, um, I, I'm sure he will be able to uh, bring it up in concluding. The Scottish Government needs to uh, go back to the beginning of this process and substantively and meaningfully engage with the key stakeholders in co-designing legislation. And in the meantime, let's get to work in improving social care right now. As a first step, the Scottish Government should immediately introduce the key recommendations of the FILA report, including removing non-residential care charges and tackling poverty pay in the social care sector. It is clear, presiding officer, that we do not need to wait for a national care service to begin to address these problems. And indeed, we have been making that argument from these benches for many months. The Government could take action here and now to improve the social care sector if it had political will to do so. What the Scottish Government is proposing in its current form is a national care service in name only. 
The Scottish Labour Party aspires to see a properly funded and well-planned national care service. And that means local delivery whilst maximising standards, creating a race to the top by forcing bad actors who do not deliver high levels of service out of the system. The Scottish Government must listen and reflect on the growing worry from, the growing worry from stakeholders, trade unions, frontline staff and local authorities and show some humility. It is time for the Government to pause and to meaningfully listen and properly engage so that we can create a national care service that Scotland deserves. And I move the amendment in Jack Bailey's name. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr O'Kane. And I call Alex Cole Hamilton uh, for up to four minutes, Mr Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, I'm pleased to rise for the Scottish Liberal Democrats and I'm very grateful to Craig Hoy for bringing us this debate this afternoon. Deputy Presiding Officer, words matter. What we call things matter. And the government have sought in the nomenclature around the National Care Service to dress this up as our most treasured national possession. Um, small wonder then that the public response to that is that they regard this as a mirror image of that thing that they hold so close, that we all hold so close. But this is anything but. The NHS was forged out of the rubble and poverty of war. It is free at the point of delivery. Nothing about that uh, emulates, is emulated in the National Care Service. And Liberal Democrats have made no secret of our opposition, opposition to these plans from the very start. The SNP Green Government has stood by and watched the disintegration of our health and social care sector. This is on their watch. And rather than taking the immediate action that is so desperately needed right across that sector, their response is an ill-fated bureaucratic exercise which is already turning into a mess. But, but, presiding officer, even I'm surprised at how quickly the wheels have come off the wagon here. Already, legal experts, auditors, council officials have slammed government plans. This week, the chief executive of East Ayrshire Council said local authority leaders had no certainty as to what services were going to look like over the next three or four years. He described the current circumstances as truly unstable for social work and social care. At this week's Finance Committee, as we've already heard, officials described uncertainty about how much these plans would cost, with a suggestion it could even spiral beyond the government's estimate of £1.3 billion. Pounds. Presiding officer, the alarm has even been raised from within the SNP's own ranks, and we've heard something of that this afternoon in a, a rare act of dissent among the collective, but one that is becoming a little more common these days. I will. Michelle Thompson. Uh, just to put on the, the record as somebody who raised some points, I am absolutely in favour of uh, this National Care Service. It's absolutely the kind of audacious and ambitious project we should be doing. However, I'm carrying out my function in terms of financial scrutiny, and I think other parties would do well to heed this, for example, uh, the Tories. Alex Cole Hamilton. Well, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I can only imagine that Michelle Thompson's uh, mobile phone must have been red hot between the uh, time she made her remarks that she had no confidence whatsoever in the intervention she's just made. But she did say that, and she said she was completely surprised by the lack of detail in her government's financial memorandum, as are we all. Sadly, it doesn't come as much of a surprise to the rest of us. Presiding Officer, Many have rightly questioned the wisdom of spending huge amounts of money on structural reorganisation rather than supporting hard-working staff. We must, I'm afraid I must make time. I only have four minutes. We must remember that despite the incredible important, incredibly important service they provide, social care staff are amongst the lowest paid in our society. The cost of living crisis as such is hitting them the hardest, and more must be done to help them. They will leave the sector and seek fairer pay if we do not, and who could blame them? Presiding officer, no one is arguing that change is not required, reform is not needed. Of course it is, but it must be good change and genuine reform. Staff and service users need that change now, not in five years' time when this bureaucratic monolith is finally set up. If we're Liberal Democrats in government in Scotland right now, we would reward staff now with better pay, with better conditions, career progression, powerful national collective bargaining. We've set out national standards to get rid of the postcode lottery that currently exists in social care so that everyone gets the same level and quality of care, no matter where they live. Instead, the government just wants to remove power from local service providers who know best how to use it and place it in the hands of the government ministers who've proven themselves to be incompetent time and time again. The playwright, George Bernard Shaw, once said, progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. Presiding officer, this government would do well to heed that lesson and get things uh, before things get worse. The government's plans could not have been more poorly thought out, and so I urge them to think again before it's too late. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Cole Hamilton. I now we move to the open debate. I call uh, Liz Smith to be followed by Emma Harper for up to four minutes. Ms. Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jackie Bailey said last week that she has a long memory when it comes to parliamentary experience. And whilst I can't compete with her in terms of longevity, I can get quite close. And I certainly remember a couple of occasions when there were very serious concerns about financial memoranda which were designed to underpin, underpin major pieces of legislation. It happened with the Children and Young People's Bill, and it happened with college regionalisation. But never in my time in this place have I seen a financial memorandum which is so out of kilter with the ambitions of the bill presented and so lacking in detail. Now, Michelle Thompson and Kenny Gibson were spot on last week, and Michelle Thompson is spot on again this afternoon when they say quite correctly that they have a duty when it comes to scrutiny. They do. And it's not possible to have confidence in the financial memorandum and that it is a monumental risk to taxpayers. That is not, that is not a good place for the Scottish Government to be in. It is not a good place for this Parliament to be in. And when it comes to the scrutiny of the bill, and it certainly doesn't adhere to the request from Audit Scotland to ensure that there are more accurate financial memoranda accompanying legislation. I give way to you, Michelle. Ms Thompson. Okay, thank you for giving way. I think we have to fairly concede, however, that the larger and more audacious and ambitious a project is, that that point in time it is incredibly much more difficult to come up with accuracy in any financial memoranda. I know that from my business experience of delivering large-scale transformational programmes. Would she concede that point in fairness? Liz Smith. I, I'm judging by my time in this Parliament, which now stretches to 16 years. I have never in my time seen a financial memorandum that is so lacking in that situation. And as Audit Scotland points out, there are a number of costs associated with the bill that are yet to be assessed. National care boards, transition costs, pensions, VAT, capital investment and maintenance costs, which are surely extremely important and obviously of considerable concern to stakeholders. Then there's also the issue raised by the Fraser Valander Institute, which suggests that those groups trying to estimate the costs, they had to persistently question civil servants to find out about which additional costs beyond the core costs mentioned in the financial memorandum to be set out. These are key questions which are being asked by virtually every stakeholder, uh, which uh, is, is obviously something that I, I would have thought is very considerable uh, concern uh, to the Scottish Government. And it's entirely the wrong way round, I would suggest, um, to, to have this concern where it's not possible to scrutinise enough of the bill. And that's why COSLA, the councils, trade unions, frontline staff, uh, in both the private and public sectors are getting angry because they simply don't have the answers that they need. So let me turn finally to the evidence presented by Rafe Roberts on behalf of the Chief Executives of the NHS Trust. He rightly cited the very welcome focus that the Scottish Government has had on improving social care, on developing better quality and consistency when it comes to data and on ensuring that some of the intense pressures in the NHS regarding the workforce are addressed. But when asked about the extent of restructuring on a scale that is equivalent to major reforms like the centralisation of the police force or college regionalisation, he was much more sceptical. What is proposed by the Scottish Government is not something that is supported by NHS chief executives at this time. The very time where they are having to deal with other pressures and when all the spare capacity is already taken up. Mr Roberts suggested that there are other ways that should be looked at to tackle the issues at stake before this leviathan new structure is even contemplated with so many costs unaccounted for. They are asking if this bill is actually necessary to deliver the desired ambitions, not just because of the current economic challenges, but because of the extensive disruption that is likely to be needed in terms of structural change. So I have got every uh, support for the motion that is in the name of Craig Hoy. Thank you, Ms Smith. And I call Emma Harper to be followed by Carol Mochan for up to four minutes. Ms Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Here we go again, these opposition debates talking down the commitments of this SNP Scottish Government and indeed our hard working NHS and social care staff they are becoming wholly tiresome in this ch chamber. Last week it was Labour, this week it was Tory. It's becoming increasingly harder to see the policy difference between the two 
better together, coming back together, making a massive buckle midden together in the lead up to our Indy ref. Maybe that is just what's going on, presiding officer. And anyway, to dispel the drivel that we can see in the Tory motion, the establishment of a national care service will be the most ambitious reform of public services in a wee minute. It will be the most ambitious reform of public services since the creation of the National Health Service. The National Care Service, as proposed in the Bill, will bring together social work, social care and community health to strengthen health and social care integration for adult services. And I will give way to Liz, Liz Smith. Smith. Uh, thank you for giving way. And, uh, I accept the situation that the member has just outlined, but does she, does she really accept that when it comes to this bill and what stakeholders are saying, that they are comfortable with this bill because every single one of them who has given evidence that the Finance Committee has spoken to us is saying that they don't. Emma Harper. So what I do know is that what's at the heart of the bill is caring for people, caring for human beings, looking after the people whose verbal responses to the consultation said that they wanted a, a more joined up service that brings all the care providers together. So by the end of this Parliament, accountability for adult social work and care support will transfer from the government to the ministers, and the ministers will be accountable. I'm sorry, I didn't have time. These wee four-minute debates don't really allow us to get on the record what we want as far as debate, but I'm happy to speak to any member after this if they seek a more detailed response. So, the bill will increase transparency and standardise the delivery of care to eradicate the current postcode lottery system of care. Importantly, it will take the focus of social care away from today's for-profit industry and into a system focused on human rights, human rights, presiding officer, and high-quality care. Contrary to the Tory motion, presiding officer, this bill does not centralise social care. It's a framework bill. Right? The framework bill means that other regulations will come after that, affirmative regulations that we will be able to scrutinise again. It means that it allows, I'm sorry, this again, I want to just proceed because I do have some particular points to make. So, for example, regarding the approach to how it works better, Dumfries and Galloway and the, and the Scottish Borders, their large rural areas, they will require a bespoke approach to the challenges of distance and rurality. So the bill allows for this, but ensures the standards of care in D&D and &D the Scottish Borders that are separate and bespoke, but certain standards will be matched nationally. This is, has to be welcomed and will ensure high standards of care. I would have thought that the opposition could get behind improving care standards and ensure a wide, wide equity of care, but instead they simply just continue to moan, moan and moan. <coughs> Poseidon officer, quickly I want to turn to self-directed support. SDS is an area I have worked on since my re-election. SDS allows people to receive money from the respective local authority with the aim to be spent on, for example, eh, where people feel most appropriate for them. Helping manage a health condition or disability, helping with buying technology, helping with getting out about and even support for attending work in college. Over the summer, the Minister came to Dumfries where we heard directly the lived experience of people who were receiving self-directed support. This is all part of how we take this forward, by engaging with people, by listening to people, with co-production with people, so that we can have the best bill to take forward. Thank you. I realise I'm out of time, presiding officer. Thank you, Ms. Harper. I now call Carol Mochen to be followed by Gillian Mackay for up to four minutes, Ms. Mochen. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I start my contribution by asking that the members opposite consider the fact that it is our responsibility as parliamentarians to debate these issues. And so we do have the right here. And I would hope the member before me might ask for some government time in order that we don't have to have short debates. The National Care Service has promised a great deal, but with each passing month, the weight of that ambition has been forgotten. Instead of building a truly revolutionary service, the Scottish Government are tinking around the edges in, terms, in a second in terms of what that service would mean on the ground, whilst concentrating power in their own hands rather than the hands of carers or those who require care. 
I will take an intervention. Emma Harper. Brilliant. Thanks very much for um, taking me. Um, I think that as you are asking for the government to take information forward, we have just begun the scrutiny. Will not we have a stage one debate that will be able to bring this to chamber again? Carol Mochen. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Deputy Resign Officer. I think that we do have to scrutinise the bill, and part of it is the government bringing more debates to the chamber so that we can debate these issues more fully. These are important issues, and we know that people have concerns. Um, this, is, this service is, it, is, is a mere shadow of, of a universal care service could be, um, and to be frank, it does not seem worthy at this stage of the name. The Scottish Government are not proposing a national care service here at all. The plan as it exists currently would only lead to a national procurement and commissioning service dressed up in language of radical change. The profit motive is at the heart of everything in this plan, and the harsh reality of low pay and poor conditions for most workers are not set to change in any substantial way. No drive from the government for collective bargaining or to improve pay terms and conditions of some of the, the poorest paid workers. I am going to make progress because, because I am running out of, of time. As you might expect, I believe workers through their trade unions understand these drawbacks better than most, yet very few of their concerns have been taken into account when drafting this bill. Unison have quite rightly called the plans not fit for purpose and have asked for it to be recalled. I have a lot of sympathy with that point and share the view made explicitly in my party's amendment that this process must be paused immediately and the required recommendations laid out in the Philly Review should be delivered as a priority. We can do that. If we do not take stock and allow for this to happen, you will essentially be creating a service that is set up to fail, built on the broken foundations of this care service. There can be no doubt that the overt centralisation and the essentialisation at the heart of this plan is designed to further disempower councils. Unite have expressed concern about the proposal to hand power to unaccountable local care boards who will deliver services with no democratic mandate. And it is clear that COSLA are firmly against these plans, stating that the government are planning to remove decisions about locally delivered social care services from communities and hand them to Scottish Government ministers in Edinburgh. This does not sound like a step forward to me. It sounds like an old-fashioned power grab that will put the future of many jobs firmly in the hands of the Minister, who are far away from uh, what is happening on the ground. Given the state of current negotiations with public sector staff, you can understand why care staff and trade unions have serious concerns about this. We are not here to simply tick boxes and say a national care service has been built, then move on to the next manifesto uh, promise. We are here to build something that, like the NHS, will stand the test of time. To conclude, I reiterate the Government must pause this bill, listen to the concerns of carers, service users, councils, trade unions, MSPs in this Parliament, and get this right the first time around. Anything else is a dereliction of their duty. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Mochan. I now call Gillian Mackay to be followed by Jackie Dunbar for up to four minutes. Ms. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I don't often tell personal stories in my speeches, but today I'm going to repeat the one I made in my very first speech in this chamber. My grandpa fell in his house shortly before the council elections in 2017. After that fall and his recovery, he required care in his home for the rest of his life. His carers were far more than help around the house. They enhanced and enriched his life. He loved to tell stories, and what his carers and often their families were up to became part of the stories we were told. We knew he was safe with them. They often stayed and made us a cup of tea when we needed it too, and words could never express how grateful I am to each and every one of them. His experience, and the fact that not everyone had that experience, is what drives my approach to the National Care Service. We need to make sure that person-centred care is what people are receiving. I recognise the anxiety around the lack of detail in the Bill. Framework Bills do not give the immediate certainty that is needed but this one provides the ability for those receiving care, their families and care workers, to input into how this service runs. Let us not pretend our current system is one in which these voices are always heard. This bill gives us that chance to get things right. Fair work has to be at the heart of it. I was hugely frustrated hearing from my grandpa's carers the lack of holiday pay, sick pay, maternity pay, or even consideration for something as basic as local knowledge. 
I have got a lot to get through. I am really sorry. Carers being sent from one end of the local authority to the other because a manager who does not know the area thinks the trip from Bowness to Larbert is one that can be done in 10 minutes just to come back to Grangemouth after that. Caring for care workers has to be at the heart of this bill. And that's why I will be introducing amendments to further embed fair work at the heart of this bill as part of ethical procurement, working with the Minister and unions to address some of the current concerns. We know there's a mixed picture across the country, but I believe that working in social care in Falkirk should have the same terms and conditions and culture as working in Argyll and Butte. And for those receiving care, how they receive that and what they're entitled to should also be the same. This is a fundamental principle of the National Care Service and one of the main reasons why we want to see it progress. Culture change has to be a key part of any social care reform. And as I said in committee yesterday, culture change does, not come, does often not come with huge costs attached. I agree with Mr O'Kane, as I'm sure the Minister does, that any of these issues can be tackled now. And I would like to see from the joint working group between COSLA and the Scottish Government discussion and agreement on ways to do that and advance it now. At committee yesterday, we also heard COSLA's concerns about appointments to care boards being the Minister's decision, and I wonder if the Minister might address this in his closing. I am really sorry, I need to keep going. There are some things we can agree that are good in this bill. We all recognise the importance of Anne's law. I met with campaigners outside Parliament, as others across the Chamber did. The pandemic robbed many of those of those last pressures of hours and days. I want to see better and consistently offered bereavement support for unpaid carers as well as support with manual handling and, crucially, the right to short breaks. We need to make sure this is implemented consistently to ensure that breaks cover those with multi multiple caring responsibilities in a way that is useful to them. In reality, presiding officer, there is far too much to cover in four minutes. There are some real opportunities here through co-design and secondary legislation to be flexible, listen, take account and change things that do not work as anticipated. I recognise the anxiety around lack of detail, but I look forward to working with carers organisations, lived experience and care workers to ensure that the bill delivers on its core aim, to make things better and more consistent for people who use and work in the social care system. Thank you very much. I now call Jackie Dunbar to be followed by Brian Whittle for up to four minutes. Ms. Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. Um, this Tory motion is, quite frankly, a disservice to the social care sector here in Scotland. The establishment of a national care service will be the most ambitious reform of public services since the creation of the National Health Service. The aim is to ensure consistent, fair and high-quality care for everyone in Scotland reducing the current variations that many folk have raised over recent years. The Tory motion is simply wrong. A national care service is not about nationalisation of services. The bill, maybe the members opposite should actually read it, sets out that at a national level the functions are focused on consistency through national oversight. Services will continue to be designed and delivered locally, and this is right to support delivery with and for our communities and the people they would serve. Sorry, I normally do take way to interventions, but I really have only got four minutes today. National oversight will allow for better sharing of good practice and innovation, which, will, which we know takes place right across our country. For example, Aberdeen City and Share Councils have pooled resources for years to get best value when possible. It can be done. These changes will bring forward new power sharing arrangements at national and local level. They will deliver a mix on, of the clarity people want about ultimate accountability and, crucially, the flexibility to meet local needs, such as those of our island and, as, uh, uh, and rural communities. Presiding officer, the Tory motion questions the Scottish Government's financial estimates for the bill, as well as the rationale for it. This bill follows the independent review of, audit so of, of adult social care, which showed the need for change, recommending reform and strengthening national accountability for social care. The review of adult social care found the current way of working has not fully delivered the improvements intended to be achieved by integration of health and social care. It showed the current approach to social care simply isn't working with the current system focusing on profit over people, and this must change. 
The Tory motion appears to support the findings of the Feely review, Mr. but it Hoy. would deprive this, this Parliament of the tools to actually deliver the change that is needed. Their so-called local care service fails to address those fundamental issues of consistency, quality and access. It would add to the current postcode lottery system of care, allowing, for example, a difference in the delivery of care across Aberdeen Donside and Glasgow City. Perhaps in their summing up, the Tories could clarify how their plan would deal with the current postcode lot lottery, which they constantly complain about. Presiding officer on spending, any spending decisions made on the National Care Service will be backed by regular, rigorous, evidence-based decisions. The cost in the financial memorandum largely represent investments in service improvements and terms and conditions for our vital frontline care staff. Any suggestion that the figures relate exclusively to admin costs are totally false and misleading. Yeah. This bill will also remove unwarranted duplication of functions providing best value of public funds, and this is to be welcomed. It reinforces our wider commitment as a government to take long-term action to change our society and make it a fairer and more equal place to live, work and play. Presiding officer, in conclusion, we need to grasp this opportunity to deliver public service improvement together. I encourage the opposition to work constructively with the Scottish Government on this bill. Let's get this right for Abedi. Thank you. I now call Brian Whittle, who will be followed by Emma Roddick for up to four minutes. Mr. Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am uh, really grateful to have the opportunity to contribute to this debate on what will be a crucial piece of potential legislation. I have been engaged with the local authorities on this matter for some time and, in fact, spoke to the Chief Executive of East Ayrshire, uh, Eddie Fraser, on Monday in preparation uh, for this debate. Firstly, Deputy Presiding Officer, I think it is important as a Parliament that we accept the current situation and we do try and work together to develop a solution to what is a continuing developing crisis. Health and social care in this country is in crisis and, quite frankly, it is much worse than is being reported. Frontline staff are working flat out, way beyond what should be reasonably asked of them to look after those needing health care. And for that, I know we are all truly thankful for everything that they do. That, however, cannot continue indefinitely, relying on their goodwill. Now, I note that the Cabinet Secretary for Health suggested earlier this week that it will take five years to redress this current crisis. There are two things I would say to that. And given that this is an issue it was exacerbated long before COVID, it was exacerbated by COVID. Firstly, I would say, why didn't you start to redress the problem five years ago? Yep. Secondly, I would say to the Cabinet Secretary that it will take a lot longer than five years to get a fully functioning, fully staffed NHS and social care sector. It is a couple of decades away, four parliamentary terms, so we won't get the credit from this Parliament. But there has to be a long-term strategy put in place and initiated. And I wonder, will it be the Cabinet Secretary that is brave enough to put those kind of wheels in motion? So let's accept the situation where we are and discuss this with a view to develop solutions. Firstly, from the social care sector itself, they say that they are an entity in itself and the message is that they are not to blame for the current NHS issues. Child, care, child social care adult social care and general social care are all part of the mix. And although we talk about a postcode lottery in Scotland for social care, it is only when things go particularly wrong that we hear about it. There are many positive outcomes across the country. The message from local authorities is that structural change is not required to fix where things are not working. What is required is targeted support for those areas struggling to deliver the service. Do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Learn from the areas delivering a really good service and apply that learning where improvement is needed. There are substantial differences in the way that uh, councils deliver social care, especially, especially between rural and urban. It is the local authorities who understand what dictates the way in which the service should be delivered. The proposed SNP centralisation of these services will not solve the current crisis. Where is the evidence that this is the path to take? And why do the SNP think they know better than the local authorities, the professional health care workers and so many uh, stakeholders, as, as, as my colleague Craig Hoy said, who already deliver these services? Finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, we need to retain staff. 
What is required is a system that is financed properly, that accounts for the work that social care does, both public and private providers, including financial provision to offer a decent pension as part of the package. Valuing our social care workers to ensure that retention of staff is at the top of the agenda. Social care is about relationship building. It is about continuity of care to provide better patient outcomes. There is no evidence that a national care service will in any way help this situation. What is needed is a system-wide evaluation of health and social care designed for need, not demand. Social care is the way that, in the way that the SNP are proposing is not just unworkable, it is unaffordable. Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Whittle. I now call Emma Roddick for up to four minutes. Ms Roddick. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I did find this motion uh, quite puzzling. The, the Conservatives can't seem to decide what point it is they're making, whether the issue at hand is getting good care to people who need it or not spending money on public services. And I think it should be about getting good care to the people who need it. Postcode lottery is, is a favourite term of the Conservatives, yet we are here today with the Scottish Government being criticised by them for taking forward proposals to create a national care service, an idea which is overwhelmingly backed by the public and would standardise care across the country, and instead suggesting that it implement what is essentially a formal postcode lottery. I am a Highlands and Islands MSP. I hate centralisation. This is not centralisation. You can have national standards without centralising. And from everything that I've heard about the proposals so far, and of the overall intention of this ambitious public sector overhaul, I'm not at this point worried that it is a power grab. This is about combining national standards with local expertise to get rid of a postcode lottery. And colleagues can count on me spending the rest of this process as the bill takes shape, making sure that Highland and Island voices are heard and that their local expertise and local good practice, where it exists because it does exist, is taken forward. I've already heard extremely helpful, constructive and thoughtful input into the proposals from people with lived experience of caring or receiving care. This is an opportunity, a huge one, and it would be a real shame to just chuck it out instead of putting the work in. As a Conservative colleague said only minutes ago, why throw the baby out with the bathwater? Besides the fact that it's ridiculous to say the care sector is in crisis, so it's the wrong time to fix it, I do find the brass neck of the Tories in talking about a care crisis at all quite astounding, because nothing has harmed care recruitment in this country more than Brexit, which their party forced on this country. We are hemorrhaging, despite the best efforts of the Scottish Government, EU nationals who worked in or would have worked in these roles. And I mentioned earlier the fact that the Conservatives voted against the creation of the National Health Service, our NHS, 22 times. And I would have hoped by now, in 2022, we'd have got to the point where we don't need a war to happen to get folk behind looking after our citizens. Now, out of interest, I looked up answered today for the debate on the, the 1942 beverage report. Not the first attempt at creating a national health service, but the beginning of the successful one, because I suspected correctly that there might be some similarities between it and today's debate. On the 16th of February 1943, Sir William Davidson, a Conservative MP, questioned the cost of delivering on this massive overhaul of social security, asking, what about the millions of money for those who are not in want? And Arthur Greenwood of Labour responded, they should thank God that they are in those very happy circumstances. A Scottish unionist, Charles McAndrew, also worried about the cost, telling the House, it does not satisfy me to be told that we cannot afford to be without it. But I think all of us here today can agree that NHS Scotland is vital, a core institution, and worth spending massive amounts of money on for the sake of saving and improving lives and agree that we cannot afford to be without it. So I encourage members to think about this question when they speak. In 80 years, what will folk who are living in a country with a national care service think if they dig up their comments in the official report? And will they be on the right side of history this time? 
Thank you, uh, Ms. Roddick. We now move to closing uh, speeches. I note that there are some members who were participating in the debate who do not appear to be here. I will expect an explanation. And I call firstly Jackie Bailey for up to four minutes, please, Ms. Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As Paul O'Kane rightly stated, Scottish Labour called for the creation of a national care service more than a decade ago. Rejected by the then Health Secretary Nicola Sturgeon, the SNP have finally caught on to the idea. But I have to say, the lack of understanding and vision from the SNP has led to a pale imitation of what a national care service could be. Demand for a national care service has never been greater as we emerge from the pandemic. Social care has been underfunded for too long, with rationing of care based on budgets rather than assessing and meeting need, and ultimately only dealing with crisis rather than prevention. Social workers and social care workers have been holding together a system that is fractured and understrained. But what is needed is cultural change. Let's liberate our social care professionals to do the jobs that they were trained to do, to help people live independently, to focus on prevention and to meet need. And let's fund it properly. But today we learn that £70 million has been reprioritised. Sounds like a cut to me, presiding officer, and I'm happy to hear from the minister in his closing speech on that point. But the SNP lack ambition and simply view a national care service as entirely about structural change, with little, if any, new money on the table. A framework bill with no detail reminds me of the tale of the Emperor's new clothes. There is simply nothing there. Saying you will work out the details later and bringing in sweeping changes by secondary legislation is simply not good enough. Now, we believe in co-design and co-production. We share the government's view of that. But you really need to do it in advance of legislation, not after. The bill should have laid out plans for the creation of the biggest publicly funded social care system since the creation of the NHS. It should have laid out a coherent vision for the future of care in this country, improving standards, investing in staff, enhancing care, but it falls far short. So bereft of vision that millions of pounds have been paid in fees to private sector consultants to tell them what to do. Listen to the experts, those receiving care and their carers, or the many social care staff, but do it in advance. We know what some of them think, though. Social Work Scotland, the key professional body, has asked the Scottish Government to pause the bill and think again. Unison, representing many social care workers, don't just want the bill paused, they want it withdrawn. And COSLA have made clear that the wholesale transfer of staff must be removed from the plans entirely before they will engage any further. And countless other voluntary sector groups have major reservations about the proposals. And can I agree with Gillian Mackay's comments about staff? And I'm sure she shares my disappointment that the bill is silent on all these issues. Let me turn to money. The Finance Committee did savage the financial memorandum. They were doing their job because they don't think the money stacks up. There is no idea, for example, whether they will need to pay VAT or what happens to pensions if you 2p transfer people, because that's not covered. They were followed swiftly by Audit Scotland, who said that the financial memorandum is likely to significantly understate the margin of uncertainty and range of potential costs. £1.3 billion is clearly the tip of the iceberg. The Feely Review identified a funding gap of £660 million a year, but the government is only committing to over £800 million over three years. You cannot get decent social care on the cheap. And if the government are underfunding this from the start, it will fail. The government, presiding officer, should pause now, take the time to think this through and to get it right, because we cannot afford to fail. And actually, there is a pressing need to do things now. Let me, in closing, say to Emma Harper and Jackie Dunbar, we want this to be the most ambitious reform of public sector services. But as currently drafted, it's not. We want to work constructively, but let's do the right and mature thing. Pause the bill to strengthen it. This is too important to fail. We need to get this right. Thank you. I now call the Minister for up to five minutes. Uh, uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, the ultimate establishment of a national care service uh, will be the most ambitious reform of public services since the creation of the NHS. It will end the postcode lottery of care provision ensuring quality, fairness and consistency of provision that meets individuals' needs. Uh, and uh, what I would say is that a lot of the focus of today's speeches have been on structures. The focus 
of this government is getting it right for people. And that is why the co-design is at the very heart of what we are going to do to achieve the best possible national care service. And this is not about centralisation, presiding officer. The bill sets out that at a national level, the functions are focused on consistency through national oversight. Services will continue to be designed and delivered locally. That is right to support delivery with and for our communities and the people that they serve. Very, very briefly. Craig Hoy. I agree with Cosler that consistency does not necessarily mean an increase in quality of care. Minister. Uh, consistency does not necessarily mean uh, quality, but what will bring quality is those national care standards which will eradicate the postcode lotteries that Mr Hoy and his colleagues moan about quite regularly. And I would hope uh, that at the very least they would see the benefit of those national high quality standards. Presiding officer, a change of this scale will take time. We will not rush the design process. We will develop the detail in partnership with people with experience of using these services and delivering, and those delivering them on the front line and our stakeholders and our partners. No decisions have been taken on whether children's services or justice uh, social work should be included in the uh, scope of the National Care Service. The Government are establishing a programme of gathering evidence and undertaking research to inform these future decisions. This afternoon has allowed important contributions from uh, across the Chamber in the proposals for a National Care Service. Some of them have been very positive and have had people at the heart, including Ms Mackay's and uh, Ms uh, Dunbar's. Uh, and Ms Harper's. Uh, and also we've had a wee bit of a history lesson from Ms Roddick. Um, and, you know, history uh, often repeats itself, and I think it's repeating itself uh, over on the Tory benches uh, today. What we have also done uh, and have heard repeatedly from people with direct experience of community health as, uh, and social care, as well as key stakeholders, is that the adult social care system needs to change in order to drive up standards to a consistent level across the country. The independent review referenced the current fragmented and dislocated system, uh, and it's disappointing uh, not to hear more about the views of the people that we represent here today in this debate. Change of this scale naturally raises questions and concerns, and we have a duty uh, to people to work it through with all our partners local government, health and social care partnerships, the unions and providers, to understand their position and use it to inform design and ultimately delivery. Uh, and I would ask that all of us champion and engage and contribute to the ongoing discussion. And my door is open to all. We have a responsibility uh, to people to get this absolutely right. To support people to get involved in the discussion, we have identified a set of early co-design themes, information sharing to improve health and social care support, realising rights and recognising responsibilities, keeping health and social care support local, making sure that people's voices are heard, and of course, valuing the workforce. Uh, and in September, we launched the lived experience panels to help us in that regard. We have established stakeholder register for stakeholders to become involved in the co-design of our national care service. This is the biggest change uh, since uh, the formation of the NHS. We want to ensure that people are involved in its design. I'm in my last 10 seconds, I think. Community health and social care will at some point reach into all of our lives. Everyone should have high quality services regardless of where they live in Scotland, and I hope that everyone will join us in getting the National Care Service formation absolutely right. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Sanders Gulhani to wind up the debate uh, for up to six minutes. Dr Gulhani. Thank you. The Scottish Government really needs to see sense and change their reckless and unaffordable plan to create a National Care Service. Prior to today's debate, the plan has been described as a sledgehammer to crack a nut, 
and a blank cheque for the public purse by none other than their own members in the Finance Committee. As has been said many times, the Chief Executive of Ayrshire Council described the SNP's plan as truly unstable for social work and social care, while the Scottish Human Rights Commission was critical of the vague and unhelpful language around the proposed Charter of Rights. Yep. There are more, many more, stakeholders voicing their deep concerns, and frankly, the SNP and Greens are not speaking for those organisations, nor the hard-working social care staff, those receiving care, and they are certainly not speaking for taxpayers. The SNP and Greens do not have their back, and they do not speak for Scotland. Yes, I will. Minister. Um, I thank Dr Gohani for giving way. Um, when I leave this debate today, I will be talking to Unison. This morning, uh, I was talking and listening to the Camp Hill communities. We have been out talking to people, the people that are at the forefront of care, those who have care and those who deliver it. No one can say that we are not listening. We are. Dr Gohani. I don't think you are listening, to be frank, because if you were listening, then you wouldn't be going ahead with this awful plan. The SNP have spent years hollowing out our local council with savage funding cuts, and as we've just seen today in SNP Green run Glasgow, with a deficit ten times higher than last year. And their plans for national care service were scrap local accountability and impose total ministerial control and represent a direct assault on local government, scrapping local accountability. The SNP's plan for a national care service amount to a blatant power grab, and we agree that social care provision in Scotland is in crisis. But the last thing we need right now is a major bureaucratic overhaul of the system. You should see pr precious resources diverted away from the front line into employing more management and admin staff. And we need to see the SNP abandon these plans and put every penny into local care service, as we simply can't afford to see the $1.3 billion diverted away from the front line when we are crying out for help. We support a local care service because it is important to protect individual choice and control. No one should be forced to access care miles away from their community, family and support networks. And that is why our local care service would include a local guarantee which would ensure that support is delivered as close as possible to those who need it, especially in rural and island communities. Now, allow me to turn to some excellent points made uh, during this debate. Craig Hoy reminded Parliament why the Cabinet Secretary and his ministers cannot deny that they were not warned about the risks of the National Care Service. And we're not talking about warnings from this side of the chamber. Charities, Audit Scotland. In fact, Craig Hoy went on to list a large number of warnings that I don't have time to repeat. My colleague Liz Smith reminds us of the numbers the Scottish Government thinks it will spend between 644 million up to 1.26 billion. And yet, Audit Scotland thinks this is an underestimation. And we're told that the phrase of Allender Institute raises the issue of those groups that are trying to estimate the cost had to persistently question government civil servants to get some clues as to additional costs that lie beyond the core costs. Now, in the Minister's opening remark, he spoke about a clear bill. Well, that's news to Cosler, who only saw the bill the day before it was published. He speaks of transparency, but there's no transparency running through the rest of government. He also went on to say that people are supportive. Well, laudable aims, why wouldn't they? But if you go on to say it would cost $1.3 billion to set up. If you go on to say there will be no accountability, no, no, listen to this, if you go on to tell them they have no accountability, then I believe they would no longer support you because the SNP fail to deliver. Paul O'Kane reminds us of how John Swinney listened to stakeholders yep. and perhaps the minister should copy this and show some humility. Alex Cole Hamilton spoke of how health and social care has deteriorated under the SNP watch. And in contrast to Kevin Stewart, points out that the financial memorandum has no details. And Emma Harper does not seem to understand the difference between criticising the woefully inept SNP government and NHS and social care staff. Our heroic staff, our heroic staff are burning out and doing their best despite the Scottish government. Yep. Did Emma Harper not hear Councillor Kelly at Health Committee saying staff are fearful of their jobs? The very staff she talks of are terrified.
Carol Mocken speaks of how the National Care Service would be a procurement service and not actually help the workers. She reminds us of how Unison say the bill is not fit for purpose, a, uni a union that represent workers Emma Harper talks of but seems to ignore like her government colleagues. And Emma Roddick, you said you started by saying you were confused. Uh, and what would people say in 80 years' time? They will say, what a waste of money. And look, if we're going to dig up Hansard records from 80 years ago, maybe I'll not tell you of what your party wrote in a memo dated August the 15th, 1943. Maybe I could get you to look up yourself. It's very important. It's very important that Scottish ministers listen to what everyone has been saying. And to quote Liz Smith, the National Care Service Bill is in deep trouble, and the Minister knows it. Thank you, uh, Dr Gohani. Uh, that concludes the debate, and we will now uh, move on to the next item of business after a very short pause to allow front bench teams to change position. Thank you.